how we see things in their lives that we can actually apply to our lives today. But before we jump in, let's, as we always do, go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, let's pray. Father, we, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your presence in this place. For you are not a God who was far off and distant, but you are right here with us, walking with us every day of our lives. And God, now we ask that you will bless your word. Teach us as only you can, Lord. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts willing to receive. Once again, Lord, if there's one in this place who does not have a personal relationship with you, God, I pray this morning they will. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, during the first part of the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, construction fell behind. It was because there were no safety devices used, and 23 men fell to their death. It was suggested that a large safety net be hung under the bridge to catch whoever fell, and this net cost upwards of $100,000. Well, after the net was installed, at least 10 men fell, but they were saved when they fell into the net. An interesting side note was that 20, the, the, the production increased 25% because the men were assured of their safety. So ultimately, all the time lost to fear was regained because fear was replaced by faith in a net. Now, in our text this morning, we will see a moment in Abraham's life when he was led by fear and not by faith. When instead of trusting in God, he commits a sin. And this sin is one that he's committed before, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But once again, God intervenes, and as we talked about in Sunday school, this is uh, the providence of God. God working in our lives here, God intervenes in Abraham's story. Abraham is restored, and he is forgiven. Now, the, t the title of the message this morning is The God of All Grace. And I guess the, the outline would be good for every time in our lives when we stumble and fall. We have transgression, correction, confession, and restoration. Tr transgression, we all sin, right? Right, we, we all sin. And what happens to the child of God when we sin? There's this correction or conviction in our hearts. And I venture to say one of the greatest tests, one of the greatest tests to know that you are a child of God is that when you sin, you're grieved because of your sin. That the Holy Spirit convicts you. Then we have this confession how are we restored ultimately is that when we go to God, we confess our sins and he forgives us and then he restores us. That's how great our God is. That where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Romans chapter 5. Well, let's look at our text, Genesis chapter 20, and let's just read verse 1 as we see transgression, we'll, we'll see Abraham's transgression first, but we'll see Abimelech in a moment. It says, from there Abraham journeyed toward the, the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur, and he sojourned there in Gerar. So we have Abraham here leaving the promised land. Remember in Genesis chapter 12, he left Ur of Chaldea, his homeland, he, he, he stopped in Egypt, then he arrived in the promised land. Where here he leaves the promised land, 
and goes to Ger- Gerar, which is a, a Philistine city on the border of Egypt. Now, we don't know why Abraham left the promised land. Maybe he left because of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Maybe there was some economic purpose. You know, he has livestock. He's got to provide for his family. Uh, We don't really know the reason, but he did leave. He left where God had called him to go. And I would venture to say this is often true in the Christian life for many of us me included. When God tells us to do something, and God tells us to go somewhere, after a while we decide to do something else or to go somewhere else, right? And after a while, God has called us somewhere, but we get antsy or impatient. We, we begin to think, well, even in terms of God's will, like we think on behalf of God. Maybe God's done with me here. Maybe God could use me more over there. I just don't feel God moving in my life. So where God has called us to, we decide to uproot and to go somewhere else. Maybe that's what happened with Abraham here. God called him to one place, but he goes somewhere else. Maybe that's true for many of us here this morning. can Can you see this moment in your life? We're all here this morning at First Baptist Church of Pollock. If you're a child of God, God loves you, and He is for you, and He has a wonderful plan for your life. I hope you know that. God loves you personally. Christ died for you, and He wants to bless you in such a mighty way. Can you in this moment, in in, in moment in your life know that God has you right where he wants you can you trust him now in this moment or will we become impatient will our minds wander or will we just uproot and go where God where we want to go instead of where God has called us to go in this moment in this time I wonder if we could all come come together in this moment and in this time and God use us for his glory But Abraham decides to do what Abraham wants to do. And because he left where God had called him to do, Abraham falls into sin. He sins because he is outside of the will of God. And notice what he does here. Verse 2, And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech king of Gerar sent and took Remember, we've seen this before, Genesis chapter 12. Abraham does this very thing. He goes to Egypt. He tells Pharaoh, Sarah is my sister. And there too, God intervenes. But apparently, this is a sin that Abraham struggles with. This is a habitual sin. But notice The difference between Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 20 is 25 years. 25 years of this man of God, Abraham has been faithful, has he not? Chapter after chapter, we have seen Abraham been faithful to God, serving God, believing in God. Yet this great man of faith still struggled with this same sin. As we began, we we did agree that we all sin, right? Maybe we can also agree that the sins we commit are the ones that we commit over and over. That quite often we aren't, I mean, we're children of God, we aren't doing new sins every time. We we struggle with the same sins. We fall into the, the same traps over and over and over. With, whether you're a Christian for one year or you've been a Christian for 50 years, this is stuff that we deal with. The same sins over and over. This great man of faith 
Every time you read his name in the Bible, it is synonymous with faith. And this great man of faith struggled with sin. But notice how God intervenes here, this correction, verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. So God steps in. He, he comes to Abimelech in a dream, and God is protecting Sarah, and God is protecting Abraham from this whole situation, and God is keeping his covenant with Abraham and Sarah. So in this dream, he tells Abimelech, if you do this, you will surely die. What a testament to us that when we do sin, and we do, when we stumble and fall, and we will, our God remains faithful. Although we are people of faith, we are not always faithful. We are not always doing the right thing, but when we do stumble and fall, our God remains, and He helps us no matter the situation. And it says, uh, verse 4, Abimelech had not approached her, so he said, Lord, you will kill an innocent man. Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister, and she herself said, he is my brother, and the integrity of my heart, God, and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. So Abimelech, it, uh, I guess this is still in a dream. God says, if you, if you do this, you'll die. Abimelech's like, God, I, I'm innocent. God, God, they lied to me. He said it. She said it. Look at the integrity of my heart, he says. And, and a quick side note. How old is Sarah here? About 90 years old. At 90 years old, the king is going to take Sarah. That, that either says a lot about Sarah's beauty or it says a lot about the king. But at 90 years old, that is the timing that all of this is happening. But nonetheless, he, he says he's innocent. But the question is, if you do something and you don't know it's a sin, is it still a sin? Abimelech was about to do something. He didn't know it was a sin, but was it still a sin? The scriptures say, yes, there is an involuntary sin. In Leviticus chapter 5, verse 17, it describes unintentional sin as doing any of the things by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done, though he did not know it. Unintentional sin. Even though you didn't do it intentionally, the text in Leviticus says categorically that sacrifices still needed to be made to atone for those sins. Notice God's response to Abimelech. Verse 6, Then God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart, and it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are with you. Isn't this amazing? God sees Abimelech's heart, and he is gracious to this man. Not necessarily a man of God. God is gracious to him. God is gracious to Abraham here. And what kept Abimelech from doing what he intended to do? Ab Sarah had already been took. What kept him from doing that? The text says God did. God kept him from doing it. Consider this verse, and I love this verse from the book of Hosea. Hosea 2.6. Therefore, meaning I, 
will judge. I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. That verse in Hosea talks about God having a hedge around her, meaning the church, and protecting her. Even when the church has stumbled and fall, and we stumble and fall, God is still for us. And He is helping us. And He is intervening for us. Genesis chapter 20, verse 8. Notice Abimelech, what he does. He rose early in the morning. He didn't wait. He says he got up early in the morning, called all his servants, and told them all these things. And the men were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you have brought on me in my kingdom a great sin? You have done to me things that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you see that you did this thing? So the king comes here at this point to Abraham early in the morning, and he confronts Abraham, right? It's not easy to have others tell us when we're wrong. We admitted that we're wrong sometimes, right? When we do something wrong, somebody confronts us. When they tell us it's wrong, it's not easy. Now, we react in many different ways. Some people, if you confront them, they'll just leave. Some people will just defend themselves. I didn't do anything wrong, even though they know they're wrong. But not Abraham. And before we move on to how Abraham responds, two more thoughts to keep in mind. First, God takes adultery seriously. God takes adultery seriously. In Genesis chapter 19, God took homosexuality seriously, and he destroyed cities. But here, he is willing to take Abimelech's life over adultery. It seems like in this day of age, we have categories of sexual sin. Why? When the Bible says it's sin, we, we say this all the time. It's sin, right? And at this moment, in this time, our God of all creation intervened providentially in Abimelech's dream because he was about to commit adultery. This is serious to God. Now, secondly, a, a second thought before we move on. Abraham's sin was not only lying, but his sin was potentially sexual sin. We recall what Lot did with his daughters, right? Genesis chapter 19, this homosexual mob was about to take Lot and the men with him. So what was Lot willing to do? Give his two daughters over to these people to do as they please. Kind of seems like Abraham's doing the same thing right here with his wife. <laughs> willing to give his wife over to the king. This, this is not good. I, I know we categorically think Lot's worse than Abraham, but here, Lot, Abraham is similarly doing the same thing. And in giving his wife over, that is sexual sin. You say, well, well preacher, Abraham wouldn't have done that actual sin. He was just giving his wife. Well, you could say there's levels to this. Years ago, maybe eight or nine years ago, I was in a courthouse in Catahoula Parish. A man had been convicted for murder. He killed multiple people. But I was there for the trial for his girlfriend or wife. Now, he, he committed the murder, but for months and weeks leading up, she kept telling him, 
you need to kill my mom. You need to kill my family. We just need to get rid of them. So one day something happened. He snapped. And next thing you know, everyone's dead except for him and his wife. Now, did she commit murder? Well, she had a trial. And she was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Was that just? Well, under the eyes of Louisiana law, she was guilty by a jury of her peers. And think of Abraham giving his wife over to King Abimelech. If Abimelech would have done something, I venture to say that sin was on Abraham's hands too. God takes adultery seriously. And that's what Abraham was doing when he was giving his wife to Abimelech. Now let's move on. Let's notice Abraham's confession, if, if we can call this a confession. Verse 11, Abraham said, I did it because I thought there is no fear of God at all in this place. And they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And when, when God calls me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, this is the kindness you must do me at every place to which we come Say to me, he is my brother. Now, when I read this, I see a bunch of excuses, honestly. Uh, he says, well, she's my sister. See, God calls me to wonder. Notice in verse 13, when God calls me, calls me to wonder. Although Abraham's confessing here, uh, he may be genuine. I, I don't know for sure, but... There's this connotation that these are a bunch of excuses. We just know that he struggled with this sin specifically. He, he lied, and he had his wife lie, saying that she was his sister, when in fact she was, but also his wife. So Genesis chapter 12 Genesis chapter 20, Abraham does the same thing. I guess he thought second time's a charm, but it didn't work out. Some people might think that this is no big deal, that this decision to, to not tell the truth, because isn't that what he did? When he told them that it was his sister, did he lie? I see some of these, and I see some of these. Is not, is when we are to tell someone the truth, and we do not tell them the truth, is that a lie? Maybe that's a better way to put it. Because there are times in our lives when we should say something, and we don't, and that is wrong, and that is sinful. And we can be deceptive in our speech also, can we? Imagine you get stopped by... A police officer, license registration, did you know your taillight's out? You say, my taillight's out? See how deceptive that is? That comes from the heart. That's the middle ground. That's not saying, yeah, I knew my taillight's out, and that's not saying, I didn't know it was out. That's playing it safe. That's deceptive. Clever, I know, but maybe that's what Abraham's doing here, telling a half truth. But the response when we sin should be confession, not excuses. Not blaming others, not blaming the people of the land who he thought killed them, not blaming God. We may pretend we did not do anything. We may plead ignorance like Abimelech. There are many ways that we can respond to sin, but the right way is confession and 
repented. Church, sin must be confessed. Proverbs chapter 8, 28, verse 13, it says, Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Oh, and keep, keep in mind this. This is a prophet of God, that's what the text says, being confronted by a worldly king. It should never be that way. We should not have the world correcting the children of God. We should be salt, we should be light, we should live the same no matter where we're at. Our actions and our lives should be no different in the church than out the church. If for no other reason, Abraham represents God. He's a prophet of God. And when he goes to a foreign land, imagine what the foreigners think of the follower of the one true living God. It diminishes his testimony of God. So if for no other reason, when we go out in the world, let's just look at life this way. We represent God. We are his image bearers, we are his children, and we need to act like it, and we need to look like it. And that's what Abraham should have done. But it didn't stay there, did it? This sin. Just a quick note. We'll see later on in uh, Genesis chapter 26. Abraham's son commits the same sin with King Abimelech. We talked about this generation, generational immorality and how our children learn our sin. Well, Isaac learned that from his father. Well, let's read these last few verses and we'll see the restoration of this story. Then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants and gave them to Abraham and returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. Now, this is kind, kind of an interesting thought, too. It is Abraham who deceives Abimelech, but in the end, Abraham is the one blessed. He's the one that lies. He's the one that deceives, yet he's the one getting all the stuff here. Even not only the, the livestock, but the land that he, he wants to dwell in. But it wasn't just Abraham. Look, look what it says to, he, to Sarah, he says, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It is a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you and before everyone who you are vindicated. So Abraham once again gets a thousand pieces of silver, you could say on behalf of Sarah. And verse 17 and 18, this prophet Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, and also healed his wife and female servants, so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So God restores Abimelech, his household, because he did what he was supposed to do. God restores Abraham and Sarah. So, in this, so at the end of the story... It's all about God, right? God receives all the glory. You know, we could make it about Abimelech doing the right thing or, or Abraham confessing. It's all about God. God is the hero of the story. He is the one who restores. He, even though Abraham made this mistake, God was still with them. Although he had this ongoing sin, God was still there helping him. Maybe you're there here this morning, and there's this ongoing sin that you struggle with. You keep doing it over and over. We, we battle with sin, some, some more than others, but this is a struggle. Friends, do not be discouraged. Even in your sinfulness, God is with you. This is not a, a testament to live like you want. This is no cheap grace, but this 
is the, the fact of God's glorious grace in spite of our wicked depravity. As we are coming out of our revival meetings, I can't say I'm revived. I don't know if our church is revived. I think those things take time to see the fruit of revival. But I can't say I've been refreshed. I can't say that my heart has been blessed. So what do we do after revival? Simply don't go back, okay? God has moved us to a moment. He has refreshed us. He has given us a vision of things that He wants us to do. He has convicted us of sin, and we ask God to do something great in our life and in the life of our church. Why would we go back? Why would we go back like Abraham does here and commit the same sins? When God forgives us, we should pursue holiness. Why would we go back? Let's move forward. Let's surrender to God. Move forward and let God continue to do the work that He wants to do. A final thought, Abraham sins. Abraham sins, and it is right before God blesses him. That's a powerful thought. The next verses, the promised son finally arrives. We've been waiting nine chapters for Isaac to come. And right before it comes, right before the blessing comes, Abraham falls into sin. That's how it happens many times. When God is about to do something, or when God is doing something, I submit to you, that is when Satan is, at, is working the hardest. Robert Smith puts it this way. When God is a blessing, Satan is a messing. When we see churches thrive, when our church is thriving, and we see growth, I venture just think about it. If there's no movement, no growth, what does Satan even care? He's getting his way anyway, right? But right on the heels of God giving Abraham the thing that he longed more than anything in the entire world, that son who would be his seed, the son by whom we would have the stars of the sky, right? Right? The promised people, a promised nation, Abraham fell into sin. Beloved, in life, I know we can be afraid. Abraham was gripped by fear here. But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and a sound mind. Keep the faith. And our great God of grace will be present with us, and He is so gracious to us, and He will restore us. As the hymn goes, marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. As we have our time of invitation as Jason and George come, if you've not experienced the saving grace of God this morning, if you do not know Him as Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you to, to come this morning, and I love to speak to you.